Welcome. Welcome to um, the third meeting of the Virtual Heritage Group. It's even more of an experiment than the first two meetings were, where we're trying to get lots of participation from, from others. Uh, so bear with us we'll, if things don't work quite as well as they should. Um, could I ask, please, that everyone uh, mutes uh, who's not speaking, because that cuts down extraneous noise. And those of you who are speaking will, at some point, will need to unmute yourself. Um, it will be probably better if those of you not speaking uh, could turn off your video as well, because that reduces the bandwidth issues and possibly makes the likelihood of a clash less. But who knows with these things? Um, uh, but as I say, welcome. Those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Baker. Uh, I look after the website for the Society and the social media for the Society. Um, uh, I'm chairing this evening. My colleague Andrew is in, well, so you should say I'm in Litchfield. Uh, my colleague Andrew is in deepest, darkest Devon. <laughs> Hello. Um, uh, and he'll be looking after discussion uh, later. And another colleague, George, uh, is in the Canuck area, and he's doing things like recording and uh, helping with the chat function, letting people into the meeting and so on. Um, so, um, as I say, the rule, general rules are if you could keep mute as far as possible right the way through, uh, unless you're called on to speak. Uh, we'll be breaking briefly in the middle uh, we've got a number of presentations. Uh, we'll be breaking briefly in the middle uh, to let folk have any questions or what have answered. If you've got any questions, could you put them in the chat function, please? And then we'll either ask you to put them yourself or we'll uh, uh, we'll read it out and let the presenter uh, present, uh, answer the questions. Uh, I'm going to share screen now and We'll begin. Um, we've got maybe 10 presentations. I should say, uh, please keep it under five minutes if you possibly can, apart from Andrew, who I know will go on a bit longer than that, um, uh, just so that we get through things reasonably quickly. Um, so I, as I say, I'm going to share screen and we'll see if it all behaves properly. There, now you should see in front of you uh, the front screen for the presentation. Uh, if things appear to be going wrong, then um, send us something in chat and George will stop me and tell me. Uh, the first of our show and tell items, that's how I'm thinking of it, uh, as if you're six or seven year old going to school, um, is uh, hardly show and tell. It's a song. Alan Graham uh, wrote to me and said, there's an obvious soundtrack in the music of uh, Mike um, and John Raven uh, that might bookend the talk. And I thought that was a great idea. Unfortunately, I have to say, I learned uh, two or three days ago that Alan has been taken into hospital in Winchester Royal Infirmary with breathing difficulties. Uh, so uh, I know no more than that. His son said he, it was obviously serious, but um, he, there's every hope of a proper recovery. Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce the songs as best I can themselves. The first one is actually one that does have a personal resonance to me. Many of you will know it, Push Boys Push, uh, the Dudley Canal Tunnel song. Uh, I first learned, heard of this in folk clubs in, uh, in the area in the late 60s. And uh, I was actually quite privileged at being at that, which is, if you can see it, uh, the brochure for the opening of the Dud reopening of the Dudley Canal Tunnel in 1973. Uh, George, who's uh, helping, tells me that that's on eBay at about £30. So I've got a precious artifact there um, and it's travelled with me over the years. So we'll start by listening to John and Mike Raven. Push, boys, push. Oh. 
been going through push boys push since 1792 push boys push it's a crime and it's a shame if we cannot do the same so push boys push oh push boys push don't let your strength to fail push boys push cause we're coming to the jail push boys push you may get stuck inside if the boat it is the wide so push boys push oh push boys push the tunnel's two miles long push boys push that's why we sing this song push boys it keeps our spirits high, oh, we cannot see the sky. So push, boys, push, oh, push, boys, push. And now we're coming high, push, boys, push. But oh, don't you see the sky? Push, boys, push. We'll have a celebration, now we've sung it to the nation. So I think that possibly brought back memories for a number of people. Um, and we'll go on to more about canals. Uh, so uh, can I ask uh, Jeff Taylor if he'd unmute himself, show his video, although he is showing his video, and talk about his canal memories. And we sent me some pictures to put on the slide. So over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Well, just a very quick preamble then. My, my grandfather, Joseph Harry Taylor, was not only a boat builder, but he was also a licensee. He was licensee of the Victory Beer House, I think known locally in Reedswood Park area as the Victory Pub. So he was both a boat builder and a licensee. And in 1979, in the days when family history meant foot slogging and writing letters to newspapers, I wrote to the Walsall Observer asking if anyone had any reminiscences and reminiscences of the uh, victory. And I got a beautiful set of letters from a Mr. Bert Wood who lived in Cannon Street, two which I'll now share with you. I've had to reduce them to fit into the programme. April 1979. Dear Sir, I remember steamboats on the Bentley Canal and I can remember rowing boats being hired out for pleasure on the old canal at the bottom of Bentley Lane, Walsall. Also, I can remember the old Victory Public House, which was nearby. I used to go for a few walks through Reedswood Park to the Victory Pub on a Sunday night in the summer. It was an old fashioned pub set in a nice country atmosphere. There was a very large lawn you could sit on and have a nice quiet drink. There used to be a lot of people go there for a drink. When I was a young chap, I used to go on the canal with my pal, whose father was a canal boatman. He used to fetch slack from the fair lady pit at Norton Keynes for the Walsall power station. My pal did the steering, and sometimes I used to walk behind the horse on the towpath. I used to love it. I remember Ernie Thomas's boatyard at North Walsall. I used to watch them making and repairing the boats. I liked to see them doing the corking. Ernie Thomas said they used horse manure to do the corking. Yours sincerely, Bert Wood. I should add everyone that when he talks about horse manure, he's referring to a substance called chalico, but that's a subject of my normal Taylor's Boatyard talk, which they use for parging the inside of narrowboats. He then followed up 
a few weeks later with a delightful letter describing his work in the Civil Defence Heavy Rescue Squad during the Second World War. A most charming description of what was going on at that time. I'm sure you'll agree. In a follow-up letter, Bert wrote to me this account of the Heavy Rescue Squad during the Second World War. <clears throat> As you are interested in canal history, I must tell you, during the last war, I was stationed at the Public Works Depot in Blockswich Road, a few hundred yards from Key's Boatyard. I was in the Heavy Rescue Squad Civil Defence, <clears throat> and while on nights we did 12, ne week, 12 weeks nights owing to the air raids, our squad had to put the stop planks in the canal. We went out about 11pm in the blackout to Raybowls Bridge and the Gage Green Lane Bridge, Pratt's Bridge, the Forest Lane Bridge and Fishley Lane Bridge. The planks were stacked on the towpath near each bridge and we had to put two long planks across the canal, one on each side of the slots uh, on the side of the canal. And then four of us would walk across these planks edgeways with metal hand hooks, two men at each end. We walked across the plank and dropped the, the planks into the slots. And when we had about six planks in the slots, all the chaps would get on the planks on the top of the slots and their weight would push them down to the bottom, bottom of the canal. The top one would be about the level of the water. Then a man at each end of the slot would knock a large wedge in the end of the slot to hold the planks down. It was a tricky job in the blackout. One or two men fell in the canal, but I was lucky I didn't. Although me and my mate took the planks across to the other side. The idea was to save water in case a bomb hit the canal. Only the water between each set of planks would be lost. I hope this is of interest to you as a bit of canal history. Yours sincerely, Bert Wood. Well, I can only thank Bert Wood for sending me those letters and having the ability to share them with you this evening. I think they give a lovely little glimpse for me personally into my grandfather's work in the early years in Warsaw and work in the Second World War. Thanks. Thank you ever so much, Jeff. Um, uh, you might have noticed I was looking down during that. I in uh, in the first two items. We've had three requests for the Zoom link appear. Uh, so I've been trying to send that. Uh, we'll see whether people come online. Um, but thank you, Jeff. Uh, can I remind you, if you want to ask any questions or say, make any comments, please use the chat function. And can we next hand over to Jennifer Walker, please? Jennifer, are you there? If you are, could you unmute and show yourself if you wish to? Jennifer there. Is she there, George? Can you see? Uh, she is in the list of participants, but she's currently muted with her video off. Um, she should have the ability to start it herself. Um, I've also sent her a request for her to... Oh, hello. there we go. Yeah, I had unmuted. I don't quite know what the problem was, but hello, everyone, anyway. Um, hello, Jennifer. Carry on. Share right. We're going to move from canals to roads now. And I've got a twofold purpose in putting the picture up. First of all, the vehicle itself. I know a lot of people are interested in old vehicles. And some years ago, I showed the photograph to Ron Moss, who many of you will have known. And this was the information he gave me. The photograph is a classic. It's a photograph of one of Samuel Johnson's coaches of Starbridge, a solid, tired, open top sharabang. I phoned up a colleague of mine who, like me, is also a member of the Omnibus Society. He has to hand lists of vehicles registered to operators, giving dates, types and registrations. With a glass, I read the registration number AB7566. And within a few minutes, he told me that it was a Burford, a GB USA company that only manufactured chassis between 1914 to 1935. Quite a rare vehicle. The Shara was obtained by Samuel Johnson in 1920. He goes on to tell me that he had a copy made, a, a coloured copy made and blown up to A4 and put it on the wall. So he must have been quite impressed with it. 
but I have a more personal reason really for um, putting the picture up as well. I'm just very intrigued by the group of people on the, uh, on the Shara. What, what's the purpose of the outing? I mean, obviously Shara Brang trips were very common before we all had our own isolating means of transport. But this looks like a, a quite a select group. They're mainly young men here. Uh, I might have had some sort of a clue as to what might be going on, as that's my grandfather just behind the driver leaning over the edge of the Shara. So what were these group of men doing? Where were they going? I know he belonged to various Bible groups. He belonged to Bible groups at the Wesleyan in Old Hill, just on the junction of Hales Owen Road and Station Road, now demolished, and also Macefield Mission in Claremont Street. So was it a group of, uh, a, a man's Bible group uh, going out together? Perhaps rather a large group for that, but uh, these were often single sex groups who had Bible classes. Uh, was it an evening class? He attended, in the early days of his work, he attended uh, evening classes down at the Stute, the, the institute uh, founded by Mary MacArthur, who was uh, mentioned in the last presentation. And uh, maybe these were some of his fellow students. Maybe they're some of his work colleagues. He worked most of his working life at Stuarts and Lloyds at Combs Wood. And more particularly, he belonged to the choir at Combswood. And this is really one of the questions that I, I want to ask, and I'm sure somebody will have the answer to. Um, somebody may have also have this photo and be able to actually give me an answer. But with regard to the Combswood Choir, I think he told me, although my memory may be faltering, that the, the choir once went to sing at an FA Cup final. Now, is this likely? that a local choir would have gone to an FA Cup final? And if so, was this a local team that played in the 1920s? Perhaps it was the Baggies down there. So did Comerswood Choir go and sing for the Baggies uh, at an FA Cup final? And that's it. Thank you ever so much. Um, there's a question there as to what is it? And I, perhaps some people online would like to know. Can I say that if folk are listening to this on the recording and something comes to them, please do send a, an email to the society and I'll pass it on to, to Jennifer. Uh, we can actually, uh, um, if anything comes up in chat, we can talk about it when we have a break in a few moments after another three or four presentations. Thank you very much indeed though. Um, our next presentation is from two places, I gather. This is going to be from uh, Jennifer and Emma Pursehouse, who are in different locations, which is really pushing the technology a bit, I think, here. Uh, but we will see if it works. So uh, Emma probably doesn't need any introduction. Um, uh, she is fairly well known. Uh, but it's great to see her mother, Jennifer, here. And they're going to actually talk a bit about the family shop. We are. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, the picture that is there in front of you, um, it got lost. So we're, we're very pleased to have found it. Mom, do you want to tell people what happened when it got lost? Yes. Um, I was using this picture of my mother, Emma's grandmother, at a reminiscing group at the art gallery. And that went very well. And then we met Ned Williams, who was writing his one of his Gornal books at the time, and I promised him this photograph and arranged to give it to him. And then when I went to look for it in the place that I thought it was, it was missing. So it has been missing now for about four years at least, probably more. And then Emma came to my house to tidy up a bit <laughs> as you do, as daughters do, <laughs> and out dropped this photograph. So if Ned's watching, <laughs> I do apologise. Uh, Ned, can write to, Ned sent me a, a request for a link at about 25 to 8. And oh, I he might he's be got there. It and he's just come online. <laughs> and be there, oh, so. right. 
Mom, can you tell Thank people? You. Can you tell people when you think the photo was taken and who it's? Who, and we know it's yes. Grandma, but think, who she is? Yes, I think uh, obviously it's Emma's grandma, my mother, and she's about seventeen. So it would be 1923, which would be exactly 100 years ago to this year. Um, the family had a shop, which was in the front room of the house, basically. And it was Clarence Street, Upper Gornal, and number 36, we think. Um, I obviously don't remember it. I did visit the house once, but it was back to a normal house and obviously new tenants who were in it so I can't remember much about it but it's we think the house still exists we were trying to find the number it was 36 at the time but obviously things do change but my mother was one of 12 children and they all lived in this house at some point uh two died it um obviously I think they were actually born when they were babies and they were named because they were named Jim and Emily. And then two more came along and they, they named them Jim and Emily as well. So that's a bit complicated, but my mother was one of them. My mother was the youngest and the eldest was 20 when my mother was born. So uh, there was a big gap and my mum worked in the shop um, until she got married at 24. She didn't have another job. And I think the family were a bit, felt a bit sorry for her really because she had to just stay at home and help her mother in the shop. Um, they also had um, a bakery at the back of the shop. And they used to have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to bake the bread fresh, obviously. And my mother would have to deliver it uh, from Gornal to Sandy Fields, which isn't an, isn't an easy walk. Uh, obviously she'd have to walk and she'd have to carry a basket with the loaves in. I don't quite know who she delivered to, um, but I get the impression there was some sort of wealthy people that she delivered to, but other than that, I don't know. So over to you, Emma, you can ask me something else. <laughs> well, we wanted to know actually from the audience, we've seen quite a few photos, haven't we, Mom, of people standing outside shops? And we wondered if yeah. that was a thing where photographers actually went round and offered to take pictures of proprietors outside their shop fronts because um, we've seen a few like this, and obviously we don't think that the family would have had um, a camera of their own. So that was something we wanted to ask the audience potentially. Well, can we come onto that in the chat when we break it? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and then yeah. we would just wanted to finish really by telling you an anecdote about a family name. Um, can you tell them the name of uh, of uncle, the unusual name of uncle, mom? My uncle was one of my mother's brothers. And his name was Ari, spelt, well, it's O double R I E. And the anecdote was that when he was going to be, well, christened, I presume, or, or registered, his father, who was called Harry, Harry Pugh, um, said, well, in this neck of the woods, there's no point calling him Harry because it'll end up as Ari. And they christened him Ari, and it's actually on that as the sentence as on the census as Ori. And then recently we've just found out that um is it his great grandson, Mum? Yes. He's actually taken, they've actually given this new baby the middle name Ori in on, honor of his um great granddad. But we just thought that was a little funny anecdote, the idea of Harry becoming Ori because it's black country. And we'd just like to end there, but obviously if you've got any questions in chat, we, we can answer. Yeah, yeah, we'll come on to that in a few minutes. Yes, yeah. thanks well, thank very much. This, thank you ever so much, both of you. Thank Brad, you. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to come on to, uh, is Donna online, George? Yeah. Oh, good. Donna, yeah. as you will find out, is from Delaware in the USA. 
Uh, so she's possibly the furthest away from us. Um, so we go from Gornal to Delaware. Uh, and Donna is going to talk about Ned Wilkinson, Keeper of the Birds. Donna, hand over to you, though. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't like to speak, but <laughs> it's a very interesting story. So, um, so my name is Donna, and um, I'm sharing the story of my black sheep ancestor. Um, he's my uh, second great grandfather, Ned Wilkinson, and he was known as uh, Keeper of the Birds. A little bit of background about about Ned or Edward. Um, he was born in 1833. He lived most of his life in Oldbury, mostly on Tat Bank Road. And his occupation in the census was always listed as a coal miner. So I never thought anything more about it until um, I later did some research and found out that he was a well-known trainer or feeder for fighting, like for cockfighting, for bird fighting. So um, the family legend always said that we had some distant relative that was involved in cockfighting, but I thought it was not a direct line and I was surprised when it was. <laughs> so, um, he, um, a little bit of information about, if you're not familiar with cockfighting, it's, it's really an interesting subject, but um, I guess cockfighting is considered a, what they call a blood sport, where they, you know, it's so it's violent. Um, traditional sports, blood sports were like bear and badge hunting, bull running, dog fights. They were very, um, you know, well-known activities during the um, 18th century and 19th century. And they appealed to people of all social classes. But apparently cockfighting was, um, I found this on the British Library um, or Museum, excuse me, uh, website, but they said uh, cockfighting was sort of like more considered an essential part of a gentleman's leisure pursuit. So I guess, I don't know, upper class people like to, to bet on, on the fights. Um, and during my ancestors' time, I, um, Prince, supposedly Prince Edward and the Earl of Dudley were believed to have been involved, heavily involved in betting on these types of activities. Even though cockfighting was uh, banned outright in, the, in England and Wales um, in 1835. So cockfights, cockfights traditionally took place in pubs, um, but they were also held in specially adapted cockpits. Basically, they were, um, they had a wooden platform in which the fight took place and they were surrounded by like a tiered wooden benches where uh, birds were basically in bags and then they were brought out to fight. They had silver spurs attached to them, so it made it more violent and bloody. And black, I guess the black country was known, to, it was rampant with these fights as well as other types of animal fights. So the story, what, how I found a lot of information on Ned was um, through newspapers. So this is like just one of the newspapers. There's quite a few. I found quite a few arrests for Ned. <laughs> so, um, it was pretty interesting. Um, he was well known. I guess the um, people that were involved were traveled all over England um, to have these fights. They were, you know, pretty well followed. So like the first um, arrest record that I found in the paper was 1858. And it's, I don't, I don't think I showed this one, but it's basically he, um, the fight was held in the upper room at the Red Lion in West Bromwich, and he was fined 40 shillings for that. <laughs> so um, in 1869, this is a sampling, he did, there was more, but he, there was, um, he was found in Sheffield for rabbit coursing. In 1876, also um, for cockfighting, 1894 in Wednesbury. Um, for rabbit coursing as well. So there were quite a few different arrests. Um, you can look at the records, they're pretty interesting. Um, these are just a few examples. Um, one newspaper article described the arrest like this. Um, they were summoned by the police for unlawfully and cruelly ill-treating animals to wit. Two cocks armed with spurs to setting them against each other. So that's, um, there are some, some examples there. My second great grandfather, Ned, was also featured in a book called, I'm not sure if I'm saying this properly, but Aranuk, Black Country Stories. It's an old book from 1909. Um, he's actually, there's like a, um, you can see it, but there's a picture of him in the book. He's actually, <laughs> so he's like front and center. Um, also, um, this book, when he was published in 1909, 
So um, old, Wilk, um, old Ned Wilkinson lived a long life for his day, um, and his death was even noted in the newspapers in other parts of the country as well. But you can see the, um, I think in the last slide, yes, it says, um, it actually mentions what he did for a living, in, in, even on his death. <laughs> so, but old Ned was a well-known character, being in his day a cock feeder of considerable renown when cock fighting was a great sport in the Midlands. He at one time was fed for the late Mr. Joseph Gilman and was well known in connection with this form of sport throughout the length and breadth of England. So he, um, he anyway, when he died, um, he died in 1906, he's, um, he's buried at Rude End Cemetery near Oldbury. And while the grave is no longer there, I do have a photo, which I didn't share, but I do have a photo of my granddad and I um, when I was about 11 years old and the grave was still there at that point. So I, it's sort of neat to have that. Now that it's already, it's gone now, but it's, it was there at that point. So that's my story of Ned Wilkinson. Thank you ever so much for that, Donna. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. And uh, well, go and have, what time is it? Mid afternoon for you? Yeah, yeah. three o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. uh, well, you can uh, hang on a bit without uh feeling hunger pangs i don't hope anyway <laughs> no, pass on um this is the last one that we're going to have before we have a short break uh susan is i think there because i think i've seen her uh susan's going to talk about the 1957 corporate hospital uh summer fate and i believe read a poem susan uh so one of your own i guess uh yes. so susan over to you could you unmute yourself yeah, I am unmuted. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am going to read a poem that I've written. Um, I have taken a poetic license with the poem. And the photos, one is of the Corbett Hospital, as you can see below. And above it was the only photo I could find, which was from 1957. But in actual fact, I can remember going to the Corbett Hospital fate uh, much earlier than that, uh, because I went with my father, who died in 1955. So I probably uh, am basing my poem on about 1954. So I've called it the Corbett Hospital fate. We've had an awfully long, long wait for the Midland Red Bus number eight. The weather is fine and it's quarter to nine for we're off to the Corbett Hospital fate. We arrive at the large imposing gate and queue to be allowed in the place, but the weather is fine and it's quarter past nine and we can all run down the slope. There's flags and bunting all over the place and crowds gather round all over the grounds. But the weather is sunny and I've just seen a mate and we can play games at this fate. Everyone's dressed in their own Sunday best and there's food and there's drinks for us all but the weather is hot and there's beer in the crate and it's fun at the Corbett Hospital Fate. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Susan. Um, uh, now, as I said, we're going to have a slight break now. Well, a break insofar as we'll, uh, we'll uh, think about some of the things that have come up on, on chat. Uh, Andrew, have you got stuff there that you'd like to introduce and ask and comment on? Or yes, I'll I'll, I'll go through. Thanks, Chris. I'll uh, I'll go through the uh, the chat list. Would just like to say first, though, um, uh, Jeff, fantastic. Pres well, everybody's presentation is fantastic, but Jeff, you've you've um, you've answered a bit of a mystery for me from years and years ago, because I was told a very long time ago, and I didn't believe a word of it that during World War II, at night, um, people went out and put um, planks across the canal to stop German midget submarines 
coming up the canal <laughs> and attacking the black country in Birmingham. And I didn't believe a word of it. And uh, you've now explained what was actually happening. So it was yeah. half true. Planks were being put across the canal, but not to stop the German midget submarines, as I was told. <laughs> I, I, I actually understand there was there was a, 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 an ammunition depot. I mean, I'm not familiar with the area in the near vicinity that was the subject of possible German attacks anyway. That, that's again, I heard that from someone talking to me many, many years ago, but I've no substantive evidence for that. But it would make all make sense. Submarines, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, no, I didn't believe a word of it, but uh, very interesting that, Jeff. <laughs> Answered a question from years ago. Um, Heather got some in interesting information about the, um, the song, Push, push, boys, push. Do you, do you want to just say that, Heather, or do you want me to read it out? Uh, can do. Yeah, I'll... Oh, you, you're on? I'll reveal myself, I think. <laughs> yes, I'm... Oh, gosh, there you, you are. See me. There you are. Um, yeah, I, I did a project with Alarm Productions, um, and we did three short podcasts, which were basically um, for Dudley, Canal and Tunnel Trust. We gave the recordings to them, and we put them online as well um, and one of them relates to push boys push so I interviewed Glyn Phillips who actually wrote the song um, we, I interviewed him in the tunnel actually in one of the on one of the trip boats so it's got added tunnel atmosphere um, and in it he and um, oh gosh Keith I can't think of his other name sang the original version of the song and some of the original words <clears throat> when they were trying to raise money um and he also talked about how john raven took it over and made the once they uh, the, the threat um of the tunnel was was over because they well i'm not going into great detail but because the threat um on the tunnel was over <laughs> they didn't need to raise the money and it was all much more positive so john raven made the tune much more positive and you can hear both versions um in that podcast so i'll put the link in chat yeah, that's that's really interesting, Heather. Thank you. Yeah, I remember okay. them singing it at um, I think it was Wolverhampton Civic Hall. Um, went with my father to see uh, see John Raven, and uh, and I remember them singing singing the song. But it's fairly well known, isn't it? It's a great song. Push Boys, Push. Really, really good. Yeah. And I was I was really I felt privileged to hear the original version actually because Glyn's got a great voice. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great pleasure. Um, Keith, you, you're asking, um, do we know which place the photo relates to? I'm not, I'm not sure. We've seen a lot of photos. I'm not sure which one you're referring to there. Uh, Keith Robinson, if, if you're there. Some, somebody might know if you can um, tell us which, which picture you're asking about. It was the one that accompanied the song. All ah, right, with the push, boys, push. Any idea, Chris? Not at all. I'm afraid I just stole it from YouTube. Oh. Okay. <laughs> the the, uh, the the first song, yes, that's actually the album cover of the Jolly Machine, which is a compilation of songs to do with um, uh, unions, uh, unions fighting against uh, unfair practices for people in industrial uh, occupations. I think it was. I think you can find the whole album on YouTube if you're interested. Very uh. good. Uh, we've got a couple of people, Heather, Heather and Donna, um, saying lo lovely photo, wonderful photo. I, I assume that's referring to um, uh, the photograph of the of the young lady outside the shop. Uh, that's and correct. Some, and some and Marion's asking, um, what did the shop sell? Oh, it was um, a general store, we think, and a haberdasher's possibly. Uh, and then there's the bread obviously being baked out the back. But if you look really closely on the picture, you can see um, porridge oats in the window. <laughs> so <there you> go. <laughs> that, that sounds very, very similar to um, Gregory's General Store, Black Country Living Museum. Very, very similar. Even, even looks similar from the, uh, the photograph on the outside. Uh, and Emma's, Emma's also mentioned about the, uh, the lectern in St. Mark's Church, Wensbury. Do you, do you, Emma, do you know of, um, I think it was a poem, and I think it was called The, the Wedgebury Cocking? Yeah, there, there is a famous yeah, poem called The Wedgebury Cocking, um, and it's 
it's a bit it's a bit filthy in parts to be fair but you can find it online and there is a john raven version of it as well ah uh, thought i'd remember that correctly okay and we've got um donna saying i've seen seen the photo but haven't been there yet not too sure what that's referring to donna again uh, which, which photo as we've seen so many Oh, the um, that's the of the um, the lectern. I've seen a photo of that. Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've seen the poem too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. okay, Andrew. Yeah, just just going down. See if we've got any more. Uh, I think George George already mentioned the uh, the album that you're the Jolly Machine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's um, comments from everybody. Thank thank you very much for those. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on. I'm about to say the second half. I'm not sure it's that neatly uh, cut. Um, come on to some poems and things now. Uh, Keith is going to read his poem called Black Country Lungs. Uh, do you want to introduce it first, Keith, or shall I just flick to the screen? No, I'll introduce it first, please, Chris. Um, this is a poem called Black Country Lungs, which is in my um, recently published uh, poetry book from Bearwood and beyond, because that's where I'm from, Bearwood, uh, in Smethwick. And uh, it's in memory of my late father-in-law, George Sherwood, British Empire Medal, who was a true black countryman and born in a gypsy caravan on the side of the cut in Tipton. And uh, he, he smoked 40 woodbines a day. And this is his, what, happened to him eventually he got black country lungs it was on the day that harry and megan wed we came together to honor our black country dead those living too sharing that vital spark that they used to light up here at lovely lightwoods park black country lungs that breathe their last for so many the deadly die was cast with smoking and industrial disease, the cause of their much lamented early demise. Black country lungs were ravaged by COPD, a blessed release as they passed, it set them free. Women like Anne told how they couldn't breathe, her brummy lungs congested by a black country disease. Then along came Corinne to take pictures of their plight, with oxygen masks helping them to make light of this terrible disease which became such a blight but Karen came along to make them feel bright by telling their stories to the rest of the world it gave them purpose as their suffering unfurled such lives well lived in the tough foundries and mines these black country folk had shown such backbone and spine in their fight to make a living in tough times, Corun Norden Bose, this Dutch lady artist, gave them their lives back with a voice at their parting. Black country lungs breathe their last in the park. Black country folk are the salt of the earth. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much. And that's in memory of my father in law, George, as I say. He was a welder at Summers Forge on Mucklow's Hill, and he actually worked on the Iraqi supergun, would you believe? And he always said all along that the tolerances on these welds were never for oil pipes in a million world years. They were always something much, and he, they never told them what it was. And it turned out in the transpiration of time that it was for the Iraqi supergun, which Saddam Hussein wanted to fire rockets into, uh, into Kuwait. And that only came to light in, in 1991, the first Iraq war. So, and he said he was the only black countryman who could get the, uh, get the, uh, get the uh, Iraqi super gun on his shoulder. It was that big. But uh, he was a real character, was George. And he, he passed away in 2019 at the age of 90. And as I say, he smoked 40 wood binds a day. So he, uh, he lasted a long time. But that was his, uh, his fate, I'm afraid, COPD. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we move on now to another poem. This is the poetry corner. Um, 
it's uh, it's recording this is by emma whom we've already heard um it's a record it's a poem in which she speaks about the dudley port explosion of 2022 it's now the recording is a, a year and a bit old that day by emma Pursehouse. It's 100 years ago today, the 6th of March, that an industrial accident happened in Dudley Port in the Black Country, and it affected the communities around there uh, massively, when 19 young girls and women died as a result of what was later proved to be negligence. Um, this poem is my attempt really to commemorate that in some way. I did my research by reading loads of newspaper cuttings um, and information that I found in an archive at the back of Tipton Library. Um, and this poem just takes us through the day, really. That day, 6am, give or take. Maybe she got up, still frowsy with sleep. Babby's sister stirring as she creeps out of the bed they share. Bare feet padding down the stairs, huffing out freezing plumes of air. Appearing in the kitchen where mom pokes at lazy coal. The coal her stepbrothers picked yesterday off the bunk. And maybe dad is sitting in shame or a wing backed chair. Up early as if there was still a job to go to. And maybe he did say, oh, Bob, don't go today. It's no job for a wench. Perhaps Edith smiled, said she could earn enough to pay the rent. I'd like to think he put a hand to the child's head as she bent to lace her hobnail boots. And I'd like to think she looked up and smiled at him before heading off up factory road into the cold smog of a March morning. Between seven and eight. I think she whistled as she walked, waved to Mr. Davies standing on the front step of the fountain. I'd like to think Mr. Davies, a woodbine hanging from his lip, waved back. Maybe our Edith called for Edith Drew or Nellie Kay, giggling all the way from Tipton up to Dudley Port, cheeking lads who crossed their paths. Yeah, I'd like to think. They laughed. 8am on the dot. The workshop was freezing, I should imagine, even with a small stove burning. I expect they blew on their hands from time to time as they pushed cartridges through holes in metal boxes where, with a deft twist of their agile fingers, the young wenches wrenched free the paper-thin copper, which might have been the self-same colour as Lizzie Griffith's hair. I'll bet they bantered as they separated metals from live ammo and gunpowder peppered the floor their clothes. And I'll bet they rolled their eyes when Gladys Bryant's mom came to complain about low wages. Who's a thinker is, I eh? Pouring a flea in the ear of management. Maybe they sang a song or two, passing hours. 11.45 or thereabouts. I'll bet Bally's had been grumbling for a while. Not so far off dinner time. Perhaps Edith heard the fizz that one girl had reported. I hope she did. And then I hope she heard no more. Not the bang that blew the roof to kingdom come and sent the windows flying out. Or that unholy shrieking as girls ran out to burn in an open yard.
It's all Thank you, Emma, on recording and in reality. Um, I come on now to my bit, another poem, really, and a picture. Um, that's a picture. The pictures of Springvale Ironworks. It was painted in 1853 by the guy who, with the rather fine beard at the top, John Louis Petty. Uh, John Louis Petty had a was a, a very significant uh, artist of the 19th century. He painted mainly churches. He was the leading opponent of the Gothic school of architecture. Uh, Gilbert, uh, uh, he wasn't much liked uh, by the uh, people who were uh, rebuilding churches at the time. Um, but he also had considerable estate as Edingshaw in the black country. And he painted some really quite important pictures, I think, of black country industrial um, scenes. I can't comment on the nature of the paintings. I, I'm just not capable of doing so. I like them. Uh, and that's about all I can say of them. Um, but they do seem to me to be historically significant in that they're really quite early paintings. Uh, John Louis Petty was interesting because he saw something in the furnaces and ironworks that he painted uh, that was reminiscent to him of churches uh, fulfilling the same grandeur, having the same sort of sense of scale and architecture. And he wrote about this and Gilbert Scott um, was withering in his criticism of him, calling him a, a man who compares sheds to churches. Uh, but I think I can understand what uh, what Petty was about. I should say I, I know Petty because he was a curate at the church where I'm a minister in Litchfield uh, for three years in the 1820s. But I was reminded of this when I was looking at that book for, in the bottom, a, a book of poems by Jim William Jones, who some of you will know. Uh, there's that book of poems. It's travelled with me since I was a teenager. And I was telling Andrew beforehand that should you wish to get a copy, there is one copy on Amazon for $136. Uh, so um, you're not having mine, I can tell you. Um, but I want to read a poem of Jim Jones uh, because it, it sort of ties in with what John Louis Petty was saying. It's called Derelict Foundry. The foundry, vast in its desolation, is haunted with the hollow murmurs of departed time. Grey phantoms of waning light move fitfully across the dusty floor. Echoes from the pasts seem to linger where the rusting girder thrust into the distant roof. And there in that yearning emptiness, one finds in vacant places where once men once lived and toiled together. Could one share in this unconsecrated place a feeling of sanctity, as in some cool and spacious church, where the deepest passions of the soul have risen, blended and distilled? For here there is no altar, no stained glass saint, no clean white stone. Yet suddenly one feels constrained to kneel in the grey sand and flaking rust, and sense a superb fitness in the fact that one should feel his presence here. Amid this mass of ruinous gear, where once men wrought with glowing steel, defined its shape in lathe and wheel, and rich in strength made richer still, the spirit of toil, the power of skill. On rereading the book by Jim Jones, it makes me realise there are many of his poems in old copies of The Black Countryman. And it seems to be a worthwhile task at some point in the future to try and collect some of them together to make them a bit more widely available than they would otherwise be. Um, ah, no, by that time, hold on. Uh, you forgive me. Uh, the next presentation is a recorded presentation by a committee member of the Black Country Society, Brendan Clifford, and it takes forward the idea of pictures. And he's going to talk in this recording uh, about J.W. Turner uh, and his, some of his Black Country paintings. Hello, everybody. Brendan Clifford here, just with a few slides 
uh, about the famous artist JMW Turner and his visit to Dudley, which uh, Turner did uh, around about the end of August or first part of September 1830. By that time, uh, Turner looked at Turner's view of Dudley is a famous To apologise, this is my fault. Turner's view of Dudley is a famous one because uh, it's really an industrial theme. He didn't do that many uh, of those. But this was one with the furnace, fiery furnaces there on the bottom right hand corner of the, uh, uh, of the uh, watercolour. And up on the horizon, the castle and you can just about make out the steeples, the towers of St Edmund's Bottom Church and St Thomas's Top Church. Now this particular version of Turner's watercolour is the uh, one which is uh, well known and is in the late, kept by the Lady Lever Art Gallery on Port Sunlight in the Wirral. But there is another version of this paint, of this watercolour and this one. Now uh, quite faded, but this is the one which is belongs to the Dudley Art Gallery. And I've investigated the ownership of this uh, particular watercolour. As we go on to this slide, I have a picture of the Dudley Archives because that's where the watercolour is uh, mounted for display, or at least it was the last time I was in. And actually on the back of the frame, there is a little sticker to indicate that it belonged to the gentleman on the right. His name was Dr. Uh, George Charles Williamson. He was a, an art historian, art expert. Uh, and after much investigation, I found out that he had acquired the painting from the granddaughter of David Cox. Here's David Cox on the left of the screen. He was a Birmingham-born artist. He died in Birmingham as well, actually. He visited Dudley a few times himself, and this is uh, a, one of his paintings of the, the lime kilns at Dudley with the castle on the horizon. Um, and yeah, he knew uh, Turner and um, admired him very much. Uh, and Cox's work is well remembered uh, in uh, Birmingham Art Gallery. But yes, I uh, was supposed to have owned this watercolour. Uh, Williamson, as I say, got it from uh, Cox's granddaughter. And then at some point, I don't know when, it was uh, acquired by a Dudley solicitor called Henry Pearman Baggett, uh, who lived out in what we now call Kings Winford. Uh, uh, but I've never been able to find the connection between Baggett's ownership and Williamson's ownership. I've been working on this for many years. I don't know if I'll ever find it, to be honest. Uh, but it's been an interesting investigation and people do enjoy hearing the full story, uh, which I've also written up in The Black Countryman, uh, if you're interested, some years ago. And uh, yeah, so I hope you've enjoyed looking at these uh, uh, representations of Dudley and uh, reminding yourself of Turner's visit to the area. Uh, there's much more that could be said. Uh, if you ever want me to give a, a little talk to any group that you've got, <laughs> let me know and we'll see what we can arrange. Hope you enjoyed the session this evening then. Thanks ever so much for your attention. Thank you to Brenton in absentia. Uh, the next, next one is uh, not on the original programme. It's uh, another poem by James Purchase. Uh, Jim Purchase is, he, I, is a friend of Andrew's who wrote very late with a poem that he'd like to put in, which sort of around the same time as the poem that Emma, um, Emma read on recording. And again, this is a recording because James can't actually be here tonight. Um, and it's called World War One Working Wench. But I have to sort of see if I can actually sort out how to get it going. Will you keep me on, sir? Now the war is won. Will you keep me on, sir, when the boys come home? 
I lost me man at Picardy, but Babby's still to feed. Me widow's pension a lot and will cover all our needs, so. Will you keep me on, sir? Will you keep me on? There'll be no work for you, chick, when the lads come back. Gaffer's told me straight the wenches get the sack. Factories ain't no place for girls, your belongs back in the house. Tay right to see an um and out without a spouse. There'll be no work for you, chick, when the lads come back. But sir, you said yourself, sir, I was faster than any man and nothing gets sent back because a proper job I've done. I works for two and six and the chaps will get three bob. I never gives you a back lip, your nose or shuts me gob, so can you keep me on, sir? Can you keep me on? I knew your father well, chick, and you've got his hands and brains, but though this war is over, the world ain't gonna change. The gaffers still rule the lot, so it's back to where we started. The knobs make brass from bullets and we dies broken hearted. There'll be no work for you, chick, when the lads come back. But me babs will all go hungry, and it do make me rage. The gaffers would get more, not less, if they'd release me from this cage. I works from six till six, then goes home and does me cleaning. No man would do that, he'd find it too demeaning. Me mam cares for the babs, and we has but little comfort. Without this job and yours, well, me house and all is done for. So can you keep me on, sir? Can you keep me on? Then out that I can do me wench the lads in these jobs and all. If they come back to out, then what's the fighting for? You've done your bit for country just like they've done then. But now it's back to normal to build up the stocks and shares. There'll be no work for you, chick, when the lads come back. Is that all we'm good for? Us honest working wenches to raise them factory fodder and young men for the trenches? I don't make the rules, lass. It's men that does the work. It's men that does the fighting when the world goes berserk. Aye, and who makes the men, sir, to do this sorry business? God, I wish we had the means to stop us having babbies. Sir, you knows our Henry. Well, he passed for the grammar, but I taught him his numbers and I learned from me mother. I can set and tap and die, I can work to half a thou. What good am me skills if you do employ me now? It's right to keep me on, sir. It's bloody right to keep me on. God, stop your bleeding mithering. You have stated well your case. If there's one so poor sod that do come back, well, you shall have his place. Though the chaps will give me an honour for taking on a winch. I'll tell it to him straight. You have earned your place at bench. There'll be a job for you, chick, from the lad that do come back. And <laughs> when the gaffer sees your profit, there'll be no mention of the sack. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You'll never rue this day. And when can we meet again, sir, to discuss my rising pay? Indeed, having a miscellany this evening, don't we? Um, we come on now. This is the one that I've given special permission for Andrew to go over five minutes. He's going to talk about the kidnapped chain makers. Uh, he hinted at this at the end of the last meeting. Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yes, you're right. Anyone um, who uh, was either at the last meeting or uh, or watched it on the video, um, I, I did makes a reference to this the rather unlikely story of black country chain makers being kidnapped by the germans before the first world war um and it did seem an appropriate um place to do it tonight although as, as chris said it's given me a kind of permission it will go on a little bit more than uh, than five minutes um it's relates to a, an artifact uh, a booklet, in fact, a souvenir booklet. There's actually, if anybody wants to go and see it, it's it's actually in the uh, Cadbury Research Library and Archive of the University in Birmingham, where uh, which is where I, I came across it. Um, and it was produced in 1914 by Thomas Sitch, who was General Secretary of the Chainmakers and Strikers Association. And as you can see from the, uh, the picture there, it's a, a semi-jubilee, it's a souvenir, of the Chainmakers and Strikers Association, and it, it commemorated um, their 25 years. So uh, the story I'm going to tell you is mainly taken from the souvenir, but it's also supplemented um, by my own research. Uh, the reason for that will become obvious, I think, as, as we go through. A little bit of background is required. We're going back to 1906 for this. And in 1906, there'd been an arms race going on, uh, between the respective navies of Germany and, and Britain. 
uh, and in fact, uh, on the British side, it resulted in the, the, the dreadnought class of uh, rather mighty battleships. And in fact, the first one, HMS Dreadnought herself, was launched in, in 1906. Now, these, these ships, as with other, other ships, regard, um, relied on cable chain for their anchors. And Black Country cable chain was well known, of course, as the best in the world. Uh, you think Olympic, uh, Britannic, uh, and of course the, uh, the Titanic all had their anchors and chains made in the Black Country. Now, cable chain, and I put a picture of it on the right-hand side, is different from ordinary chain because uh, it has uh, a, a, a pin uh, across the centre. And the, the idea of the, the, the pin is to strengthen the chain to start with, but also it serves the purpose of stopping the chain kinking um, and tangling as the anchors are, uh, are drawn up. And that is extremely important. It is an amazingly skilled job to produce cable chain. And as I said, of course, the, the Black Country was very well known for its, its cable chain. It was generally made by teams of men. So you'd have a chain maker or a chain smith. For fairly heavy chain, you'd have two strikers. For the, the largest chain, uh, there could be three strikers. But generally, it was a chain maker or chain smith and, and a couple of, uh, of strikers. Now, there was a rumour circulating the chain-making districts of Cradley Heath, Old Hill and Netherton in 1906 that six chain-makers from Old Hill had been kidnapped by the Germans and were being forced to show them the English method of making high-quality cable chain. Now, like most rumours, there was a little bit of truth to it. In actual fact, what had happened... Uh, a company based in Duisburg on the Rhine in Germany had legitimately placed an advert in the Newcastle Chronicle for chain makers or chainsmiths to, to join their company. And two chain makers from, uh, from Old Hill, a bit fed up with their lot, uh, had applied thinking they'd get absolutely nowhere. Well, in actual fact, a representative from the company came to interview them. Um, he hired an interpreter from Leeds because he spoke no English and stayed at a, a hotel in Birmingham. Now, he well knew the value of teamwork when making cable chain and insisted that if these um, chain makers or chainsmiths were employed, that they bring their strikers with them. So in the event, six men, the two chain makers and four strikers, uh, eventually agreed terms, and off they went to Germany. In fact, very generous terms are offered to get the men to teach English cable, uh, cable chain making methods in Germany. Now, Thomas Sitch had absolutely no doubt that these men had been lured to Germany by all sorts of grand promises made to them. Now, he wrote in the, in the souvenir, he said, nothing was left undone to induce them to consent to take very lucrative positions at Duisburg. No promise was too great. No desire that the men could think of was unconceded. They were desperate in securing the transfer of the Englishmen and their strikers to Germany. Now, initially, they were treated extremely well. They were only being required to produce sample lengths of, uh, of cable chain for tensile testing. The Germans were extremely pleased with, with the chain that was being produced. It proved to be far stronger than anything the German chain makers at that time could make themselves. They were so pleased, in fact, that the managing director of the company actually held a, a garden party at his private house in their honour. I mean, can you imagine it? These are six black country guys from Old Hill and their guests of honour at, at a garden party. <laughs> In, uh, in Germany. Now, back home, of course, it was a very different story. The, uh, the capture of these men was, was the talk of the Chainmakers and Strikers Association, which is the union, and also the talk of the Chain Manufacturers Association, which was the association which 
um, many of the employers belong to. Um, even the local MP was very concerned. It seems everyone except the men themselves could see the implications of what the Germans could learn from, from these chaps. Now, it was decided that they must be rescued. So Thomas Sitch and a representative of their former employer were dispatched to Germany, basically to bring them back. Now, we, we don't know who the representative was. Um, we just know there was a representative that went with, uh, with Thomas. Now, they managed to track the men down to a, a rather nice hotel in Duisburg, which was being paid for by the chain making company. But no amount of persuasion or reasoning could convince the men to return home. As far as they were concerned, they had good, well-paid jobs, were being well looked after, and they were also being well entertained. Their mission was a failure. Or so they thought, but it might not have been. And they could do nothing more except return home. Now, as it turned out, the mission might not have been such a failure as they assumed, because a few weeks later, a letter arrived. It seems the men were now fed up working for the Germans and wanted to come home. Now, Thomas Stitch makes an assumption. It proves to be a wrong assumption as it happens, but he makes an assumption that the reason the men had not simply returned is they thought they'd probably not have any jobs to come back to. Now, this is a serious thing in 1906. You know, it could be on the street, in the workhouse. So he assumes they sent the letter um, hoping that they would they would have jobs to go back to. So this is this is why Thomas Sitch approached a chap called Sid Fellows. Now um, in the uh, in the booklet it simply mentions Sid Fellows. Further research on my part um, has shown that this Sid Fellows was actually Sidney Fellows, one of the Fellows brothers of Cradley Heath, and they were a, a very well respected name in chain making at the time. And Sid Fellows would have been able to, uh, to assure the men of employment on their return home. However, on the return mission to Germany, it was a very different situation. The reason the men hadn't simply returned home became obvious. They were virtually under house arrest, being watched, guarded even, by men who described themselves as interpreters. But it was quite clear they were a little bit more than interpreters. In fact, it wasn't even possible to speak to the men alone without the presence of these so-called interpreters. It seemed likely that what happened on Thomas Sitch's first visit, the Germans had got worried that the chain makers would simply up and leave. And they were now making sure that they couldn't. Now, getting these chain makers out of Germany without causing an international incident was not going to be easy. Thomas and Sid had to come up with a cunning plan. The idea that they came up with was simple but effective. They would buy train tickets for all of them from the station out of, uh, of Duisburg and secretly let the men know when to meet them at the station. It worked perfectly. Now, it was actually Sid Fellows um, who managed to pass a note to one of the strikers without being seen by the Germans. And the, the plan worked perfectly. The men managed to slip away unseen. And by the time the Germans realized what had happened, it was too late. They were all safely out of Germany, over the border on the train and on their way back to England. Now, Thomas Sitch wrote all this up right on the eve of the First World War. He deliberately left out the names of the men involved for fear of repercussions on them and their families. They had, after all, gone willingly to Germany to teach the black country methods of making cable chain. Now, the identities of these men have remained a mystery since 1914, but over a century later, can finally be resolved um, thanks to a, a, a discoverer made in the British newspaper archive 
of a report in the Birmingham Daily Gazette of the 18th of June, 1906. And in this report, the men are named. The chain makers were Tom Ellis and Titus Titanock, together with their strikers, Jock Knock, G. Kendall, Jack Harris, and S. Newton. And I think the final words must go to Thomas Sitch himself, who declared it to have been a stirring episode and a plot that failed. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Wonderful story. Uh, to bring the evening to an end, this miscellany of memories, we return again to a song chosen by Alan. Uh, not one that I can remember terribly well, but I sort of remember it. The Canal Navigations, again, we hear the ravens. On Monday morning we make a day roll For every man to choose his own tool But he that comes first may choose of the best And he who comes last may take all the rest For that's the roll of the ball navigators For we are jovial banks and all Off our jackets and tighten our shirts. We strip off our jackets and let them out free. We drive our poles by one, two, and three. For oh, that's the rule of the ball navigators. For oh, we are jovial banks and all. It's when that we come to the bottom most round, we fill up our barrows right. To our chin, we fill up our barrows and pile them up high. And if you don't wheel it, another will try. Oh, that's the roll of the ball navigators. For we are jovial banks and all. It's when that we come to the main plank wheel, we lower our hands and all fast on our heel. For if the plank does bend or go, a gang are on top prize. Look out! any damn to let us have our time before we go tramp. Oh, for that's the roll of the old navigators, for we are jovial banks for long. And when that it does begin for to rain, we'll take up our barrows and the whole gang in. It's into a whiskey shop we will go. We don't give a damn whether we work or no. Thank you. Thank you all. Can I hand over to Andrew? Now, Andrew, is there anything on chat that we need to talk about or ask about? Uh, just bear with me a moment. I'll just call it up and have a look. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting people saying them uh, how they've enjoyed the evening, which is, uh, which is very nice. Uh, enjoyed all the, uh, all the presentations. Um, I don't see any actual questions. But yes, thank you to everyone who's um, who's taken the trouble there to um, uh, to make a comment. So thank you all very much indeed. It was very much a, an experiment at the um, 
at the end of this series of the Virtual Heritage Group, we'll do a review. Uh, we'll probably ask questions about what went well, what went badly. So we'd love to hear your comments on an evening like this. Um, the next... Um, oh dear, uh, the next presentation um, comes up quite quickly, actually, because Easter has delayed this one somewhat. Uh, so the next presentation will be given by Jack Price. Jack is the Society Membership Secretary, so you'll be able to see him in face to face, so to speak. And he'll be talking about the novelist, the Black Country novelist, Francis Brett Young. It's uh, very much back to, to a normal talk rather than this evening that we've had together. But I'd like to thank you all very much indeed. I'd like to thank uh, every, all the speakers for doing so well and contributing, and to Andrew and George for facilitating the evening as well. Um, we will put a video of this, uh, make it available as normal. It might take a few days but to get going, uh, but we'll let you know. So thank you all very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, and I will. Um, uh, soon bring the whole presentation to an end. So thank you very much. Take care, all of you. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.